All right, so chapter 20 is going to focus on biotechnology. So we've been working on sequencing genomes for well over a decade. Um, DNA sequencing um, has been enhanced by lots of, of technology um, developments um, within molecular biology. Um, key among them is the creation of recombinant DNA, where nucleotide sequences, pieces of DNA from different sport sources, often these are different species, get combined together um, into the same DNA molecule. Um, these, the methods that we are using to create recombinant DNA are critical for genetic engineering when the genes are actually being manipulated. Um, and these technology advances have um, made huge strides in biotechnology, which has taken it from DNA to genes um, to being able to look at organisms as a whole and being able to manipulate them to better understand what's going on, as well as to make more beneficial products. So 20.1 is going to focus on DNA cloning. Um, so to be able to work with specific genes, we want to focus on the segments of DNA that code for those genes, and we want to get lots of copies of them. And so this process is known as DNA cloning. Um, when you are cloning pieces of DNA in the lab, um, you're going to need some sort of vector um, and something that's going to um, be the source of your DNA. We often use bacteria and their plasmids as a vector, um, but there definitely are other um, there are other vectors that can be used to take up this recombinant DNA. Um, with plasmids that are found in bacteria, they consist of circular DNA molecules, um, and they do go through the replication process just as the bacterial chromosome does. So when genes are cloned and inserted into these plasmids um, and are able to produce a product, um, if they are inserted successfully into these plasmids, um, we will see um, the cloning be represented uh, by the proteins that are produced. So gene cloning helps us make lots of copies of it. We take foreign DNA, we put it into some sort of vector like a plasmid, that plasmid then can be inserted into a bacterial cell. Um, and when we are able to successfully um, recombine the DNA, we get lots of copies of that particular gene. So how are we able to form the recombinant DNA? Um, DNA can be quite lengthy. We use restriction enzymes that are going to cut your DNA molecules at specific sequences. Um, these are short um, random base pairings um, that have been described over time based on enzymes that are found in bacteria. Um, and when they make cuts along the DNA to, to, um, to break the phosphate sugar backbone, they are known as restriction sites. Oftentimes a restriction enzyme can make lots of these cuts, can find lots of these pattern sequences um, throughout a sequence of DNA, um, producing many, many fragments. Um, these fragments can form blunt ends, or they can form sticky ends. They can form a staggered form. Um, the sticky ends are more beneficial because if you cut the DNA that you want inserted with the same restriction enzyme, you should get the same type of sticky ends. Um, they would be complementary to one another, and that's going to help um, bond the DNA that you want to insert into your plasmid or whatever your vector is that's been cut the same way. Um, and then DNA ligase is able to seal the bonds and to reform the sugar phosphate backbones between the two fragments. So there you can kind of see that process taking place. When a eukaryotic gene is being cloned, um, you heard me talk about vectors earlier, that plasmid um, is your cloning vector. Um, it is a DNA molecule that will take the foreign DNA and place it into your host cell and replicate it at that point. When we want to produce clones of cells containing recombinant plasmids, 
Um, again, when you want to cut them with the same enzyme, we're going to mix the fragments together. It is going to be random. Sometimes the fragments are going to go back together. Um, sometimes you could have um, two of the um, genomic DNA, in this case hummingbird, that were cut with restriction enzyme, two of those pieces joined together. Or hopefully you're going to have some where the genomic DNA and the bacterial plasmids um, fragments are going to mix together. Um, ligase will help to bond those together. And when this has been successful and you have put this plasmid back into a bacteria, um, we will be able to plate it on agar um, that's going to um, have different components present um, that will help us determine which bacteria colonies contain the recombinant plasmids based on which ones are successfully able to grow in certain medium. So this helps us to isolate those recombinant DNA um, plasmids um, that are found in the bacteria that were able to successfully take it up. So you've got your bacterial plasmid, you've got your restriction site. Notice that where you're cutting it at, um, that's where you're going to have a disrupted LAC-Z gene. Um, remember we talked about the LAC operon previously. And you also have a gene for ampicillin resistance. Um, so we're taking some of that hummingbird DNA, we're putting fragments of it into these plasmids. We get some that are truly recombinant plasmids and then we get some that are not. Um, and the ones that are not are going to have an intact LAC-Z um, gene. So we've got the bacteria now that has both recombinant and non-recombinant plasmids. Um, and when we plate it onto this agar plate, uh, we have colonies that don't have um, the intact LAC-Z gene. Um, and they have the recombinant plasmid. We can see the difference in the coloration of the colonies. And then we see the ones that do have the intact LAC-Z gene because they do not have the recombinant plasmid. Um, so there's, got a, there's a visual to be able to distinguish between the recombinant plasmids and the non-recombinant plasmids. We can store these genes that have been cloned in what we call DNA libraries, um, genomic libraries are going to consist of recombinant clones for an entire species genome. Um, so for a bacteriophage, it would be phage clones. Um, a bacterial artificial chromosome, a BAC, is um, another way that, another type of vector, it's a very large back, um, plasmid that has been created by man um, that can hold a much larger piece of DNA than what would be typically found in a bacterial plasmid. And then we can have a complementary DNA, a cDNA library, where rather than taking the raw DNA, we take the mRNA um, that has been processed, um, the intron spliced out, uh, we've added on the um, taking care of the promoter, we've added on the five prime G cap and the poly A tail, and we basically use reverse transcriptase to form a complementary version of that final mRNA transcript. Um, and so that's another type of library that we can store clone genes in. This would only include um, the DNA, though, that was used to make your RNA, or the DNA that was actually included in your mRNA. Um, so again, just some different ways you can have it. Um, and then you would store them basically in well plates and have each well representing a different um, recombinant segment of DNA. So that's just showing you reverse transcriptase. And so once you have all of these clones that contain different segments of DNA, we can use a probe to determine um, which clone contains the gene that we're interested in. Um, when we do this, we want to have a nucleic acid that we know contains a sequence of DNA for the gene that we're interested in. Um, and we want it to hybridize. We want it to bind to the DNA in one of these clones that contains a similar sequence, a complementary sequence. Um, and so this allows us 
to screen a lot of different clones that contain all sorts of genes um, pretty quickly. And once you have found the gene that you're interested in studying, then you can focus just on that particular piece. Um, so once we get that gene cloned, we can then make lots of that protein or lots of the DNA um, or lots of that recombinant DNA, the plasma that holds it. Um, and this is easier to do in bacteria because their DNA is present in the cytoplasm, whereas in eukaryotic cells, you have to make it through um, your nuclear membrane. Um, so that makes things a little bit more complex. Um, and so we also have, remember with eukaryotes, we have a much more involved promoter region. Um, we have a lot of transcription factors that are going to be um, enhancing um, that um, transcription process. Those, um, we talked about the ones that are closer to the promoter region and the ones that are further away from the promoter region. Um, so expression vectors are often used to help this along. Um, they have a pretty active bacterial promoter, which can um, facilitate getting that eukaryotic gene transcribed and then translated uh, more effectively. Um, so one other way that we can deal with the issue of prokaryotic versus eukaryotic um, incompatibility between how um, their DNA is transcribed and translated is by using another type of eukaryotic cell. So it would be um, organized more similarly, um, and that would be an example of yeast. Um, the yeast don't necessarily have all of the proteins um, that are going to be needed to modify mammalian proteins. Um, because there's a lot of factors that are going to be involved. Again, those transcription factors we've been talking about. Um, but they are per perhaps a way to kind of get things going. Um, another way that we can get into this is through culturing cells, um, whether it be mammalian cells or insect cells. Um, and you heard me talk a little bit about this this week, about how they were trying to grow cell lines to be able to do this. Um, it's definitely a lot easier to do this in cells that are more similar to the genes that you want to express. And um, a way that you can introduce recombinant DNA into eukaryotic cells is through electroporation, basically to create temporary holes that will allow the DNA then to be injected inside of a membrane. Um, so you can either create the temporary holes um, and that'll let the DNA go in, or you could physically inject it. Um, and then at that point, um, recombination takes over, and that DNA would then get incorporated into the cell's DNA. So why bacteria are able to express some eukaryotic proteins has to do um, that, you know, again, over time, there was a point where there were some commonalities to the DNA piece. Um, um, so the ancestry of living species being all connected together. Here we have PAC6 is a gene that directs formation of vertebrate eye. Um, the same gene in flies is going to direct the formation of an insect eye. And insect eyes definitely function quite differently from vertebrate eyes. Um, but the PAC6 genes um, that are found in flies and vertebrates um, do have some relationship and could substitute for one another. Um, we talked a lot about how you can get more um, copies of the DNA of interest using polymerase chain reaction, PCR. It allows you to make many copies of a specific target segment of your DNA. Um, you basically are going to take your DNA segment you're going to heat it to denature it, to separate the two strands, to break those hydrogen bonds holding the bases together. Um, you're going to use primers to help to grow that sequence. Um, and when you cool down um, the DNA, um, DNA strands, um, you're going to help to get those primers in place. 
um, so that the replication process can occur. Um, the DNA polymerase we have to use in PCR has to be able to withstand these temperature changes. And so we use a fairly heat stable um, polymerase um, that has been identified and is known as TAC polymerase. So there you can see the denaturing process, separating your DNA strand, the primers bond and the annealing process when it cools back down after um, breaking those hydrogen bonds. And then we have the replication occur um, where we are making new copies of the, we're forming the daughter strands of the original parent strands. And then we keep that process going each time um, separating the strands that have been previously made so that you can make additional copies. So it just keeps duplicating itself over and over and over again. Um, all of these technologies um, that have been developed help us to examine the physical sequence of your DNA, how it can be expressed, and then how it can actually function. Um, and so one of some of the techniques that we're going to look at um, include gel electrophoresis and southern blotting. Um, gel electrophoresis is a way to separate the components that are found in nucleic acids or proteins if they've been through, um, especially with the nucleic acids, the restriction enzyme digest um, by size. Um, and we also are able to separate them by using an electrical charge. A current basically causes these negatively charged DNA molecules um, to move through the gel. And the bigger DNA molecules basically get stuck in the agarose gel or the acrylamide gel. And the smaller ones are able to move further towards the positive um, end of the charge. Um, and so that helps us to sort um, these pieces of DNA or the size of the proteins by their, roughly by their size. Um, southern blotting is taking advantage of that nucleic acid hybridization piece that we talked about previously and separating the gel fragments um, by size um, so that you can identify pieces of DNA um, rather than looking at it wholesale. Um, you've already got them basically isolated on the gel. Uh, they're immobilized and so that's going to make it easier to identify which specific piece is going to be um, is the one that you're looking for the one of interest that you want to study further so there's your dna molecules um, they're placed in these wells the longer molecules the bigger molecules are going to be further to the top the smaller ones are down to the bottom and then this particular gel a staining um, chemical was used um, either it could be fluorescence or it could be um, a chemical like aphidium bromide um, that binds to the DNA pieces um, so that they can be visualized when placed in a light source that would illuminate those um, the chemicals that have bonded to the DNA. Um, we talked about restriction fragments, how we can use those to help to create recombinant DNA. Um, when DNA fragments are exposed to one of those um, enzymes, it will basically um, cut the DNA pieces in various places. Um, and depending on the sequences for the alleles that are found on an individual's chromosomes and an individual's DNA, um, we will see differences in those locations of the restriction sites and the size of fragments that are formed from those restriction sites. Restriction sites, excuse me. When we have these DNA sequences where they vary, we have what we call a polymorphism. Um, and when the restriction sites are changed as a result of that sequence change, those are known as RFLPs, restriction fragment length polymorphisms. And we see this with sickle cell. Um, if you um, add the restriction enzyme DDE1 um, to pieces of DNA, um, that contain the allele for beta globin or the mutant allele for it, um, we will see different sized fragments form based on that single base pair change. Um, DDE1 is not going to be able to um, fragment the DNA with the same sizes in the same places 
as, and with the sickle cell form as it is in the normal form. And so when that DNA is put on, put um, placed in wells and allowed to run out through a gel, we see that we get different size fragments. And so we talked about how you can use nucleic acid hybridization as a way to detect pieces of DNA. Once you have run your gel out and separated um, your fragments from one another, you can then transfer those DNA pieces um, in the gel to a membrane that is able to take them up. Um, once that membrane has taken up the DNA, um, you can then add your labeled probe, whether it be radioactive or fluorescent, and you want to look for those specific alleles that code for a complementary sequence for the gene of interest. And once that is found, then you can focus the fragments on focus on the fragments that are truly of interest, because as you can see in that original gel, there are lots and lots of fragments, and not all of those are going to be associated with beta globin. Um, we want only the ones that are associated with that. We can use DNA sequencing to determine um, the space pairs that are present in your DNA fragments. It definitely is um, helpful to do it with shorter fragments. And so what we do is in the process of replication, we have the regular nucleotides that would be needed to continue your chain. But then we also include modified nucleotides known as dideoxyribonucleotides, DDNTPs. And when these bind as part of that replication process, they prevent additional nucleotides from binding. They basically stop the replication process. And so once you have provided your replication process with each of these dideoxyribonucleotides, that are needed in replication. So you would need one for A, A, G, T, and C. We'll get different length segments and we can see what the codes were, which ones, um, which bases stop the sequence at certain places. When you put those pieces together, we have the sequence of our DNA. Um, so I know I did not do the greatest job of explaining that. Hopefully this picture does a little bit better. So you've got your DNA template strand you're replicating your DNA template strand, but we see that we get different size uh, labeled strands that have formed off of that template strand. And that's because as, again, those dideoxyribonucleotides bind to your DNA, they cease that replication process. You get different size bands. And because each of the dideoxyribonucleotides has a different fluorescent tag, we can distinguish them from one another and know basically from small to largest um, what the sequence was that was present on the original template strand. So we talked about how you can use nucleic acids, um, nucleic acid probes to hybridize with DNA. We can also use them to hybridize with mRNA. Um, and we can use probes um, to look at where genes are being transcribed and being used in an organism. Um, so when we want to look at single genes and we're interested in the mRNA component, we're going to focus on northern blotting. Um, we would run out mRNA samples using gel electrophoresis and then probe um, with the nucleic acid of interest on a membrane. Um, and depending on the location at which we find these mRNA fragments, um, and what tissues, that gives us a better idea of when this protein is needed um, in that developmental process. Um, that's the old school way of doing it. Um, we've talked a lot about RT-PCR, um, especially with everything going on with coronavirus and how that's one way that they're able to determine um, if you have an active infection. Um, RT-PCR doesn't require nearly as much mRNA as northern blotting. It uses that reverse transcriptase enzyme to turn mRNA into cDNA, which then can be amplified. PCR is only able to do that with DNA, um, and that's going to make it so you can just focus on, you have much more DNA at that point that can be used to do um, your 
hybridization process. Um, getting a hold of mRNA is definitely a little bit more time consuming in terms of how much you get um, going about it by taking the smaller piece of mRNA and getting a lot of DNA from it is going to help make your results um, or allow you to better understand what is taking place and feel more confident in your results because you're doing it with larger amounts of material. So there you can kind of see you've turned it into cDNA, you've amplified your DNA, and then over time we can see initially we didn't see that beta globin gene in the first embryonic stage. Um, we start to see it a little bit in the second, but then after that we see it pretty much roughly the same amount in those subsequent stages of embryonic development. We can use in situ hybridization um, where we take fluorescent dyes that are attached to different probes um, that are looking for specific mRNA sequences to better understand where those proteins are going to be found in a given organism. And we can examine how genes interact with one another, how they're expressed together and what amounts using microarray assays. Um, so when we do this, we would have lots of different tissues, or we would have samples taken at different times during the development process, or looking at it under different environmental conditions and seeing what genes are expressed in each of those scenarios. So you would want to take your tissue, get your mRNA. Again, we want to have enough of the, of the material to be able to do this. So we would turn that into cDNA. Um, we, at that point, will apply um, different genes to a some sort. It could, and this says it's a micro away, um, but some sort of tray that has spots that are labeled for each of these um, that we can label for each of these different genes. And then once we get those fragments on there, we can add our labeled cDNA to it. Sorry. Yes, we can add our labeled cDNA to it, and that's going to bind to any of the complementary DNA sequences on this microarray that contain lots of different genes. Um, so that we can know specifically which genes contain um, DNA that was formed from our mRNA. And because these came from different tissues, um, we will know then which tissues are expressing this particular protein. Um, another way we can examine gene function is through knockouts by basically disabling the gene and better understanding what its impact is um, based on what we observe. Um, so mutations basically get um, introduced through in vitro mutagenesis. Um, so you want to do something that basically destroys the function of that gene or just alters the function of the gene. And then that altered gene um, is put back in the cell and we want to see how the organism functions with this altered gene present. Um, we can also have RNA interference. We talked about that a lot when we were doing gene expression. Um, that can have an impact on whether genes are able to get expressed. Um, so that's when um, RNA interference basically binds to the mRNA that forms for a gene and prevents it from undergoing translation or just breaks down the mRNA altogether. So one thing that's been looked at a lot with humans is trying to better identify sequences on our genomes that are going to code for proteins that are absent or not working properly in certain genetic disorders. Um, and so we can use genetic markers um, that basically identify um, unique polymorphisms, single nucleotide polymorphisms known as SNPs, um, that take place randomly every 100 to 300 base pairs. Um, and if we see these SNPs found um, or, or differ between individuals who do not have um, an issue with a gene um, or an issue for an allele that codes for a certain gene, um, as opposed to ones who do, um, that might give us an indication as to where some of the genes are 
that are impacted um, are not functioning properly and we're seeing the physical expression of that through um, how the individual is presenting with their disorder. So cloning organisms um, is one way we can get stem cells. Um, and so we basically, when we are using cloning, we are taking um, DNA from one organism and we are introducing it into another organism so that we can make an identical copy of that particular organism's DNA and have offspring produce it. Um, so we've seen this with both plants and animals. And what we want to basically see um, is how far back do we have to go? We talked about determined and differentiated before, and then we have stem cells as well. Um, what cells are needed to be able to generate a complete new organism? Um, can you do this from a differentiated cell? Can you do this from a determined cell? Or do you have to go all the way back um, to a stem cell? Um, and this is seen a lot with plants. Um, where here you've got a carrot, it was placed in, um, fragments of it were placed in this medium, um, and this was used to separate individual cells. Um, those cells basically got divided, and then we start to see um, the plant grow, and once we get the plant in the soil, we are able to produce an identical carrot, or a carrot containing identical DNA, to that original um, carrot that provided the cell that was the start to its growth. With animals, things are a little more complicated. We basically use nuclear transplantation, where we take the nucleus of an unfertilized egg cell or a zygote, and we replace it with the nucleus. Um, and this has been done in a lot of ways, again, trying to figure out how far back we have to go. Here we see this is done in the, with the nucleus of a differentiated cell. Um, and so frog embryos um, have been able to show us that with ex through experimentation that if you transplant a nucleus, um, it can often support the development of that egg. Um, if the donor nucleus is older, um, we don't tend to have as high of a percentage of tadpole, tadpoles um, developing normally. So the newer that donor nucleus is, the greater the success rate with the tadpole development. So there you can kind of see what's happening. So in order to be able to add the nucleus to transplant it, we have to irritate. We have to find some way to destroy the nucleus that was in um, this, the cell that's going to provide it with all the other proteins and things it needs in its cytoplasm. Um, so we've got the frog embryo, um, and when you transplant a nucleus into a frog embryo that has not completely differentiated, um, we are able to, to turn those into tadpoles. Um, when you take it from a more fully differentiated cell and transplant it, you are not as likely to have the tadpoles grow. Um, so the newer that cell is, the less differentiated it is, the greater the likelihood that the development process will be able to continue. Um, 1997, Dolly was born, which was a lamb that was able to be cloned from an adult sheep um, by taking a differentiated mammary cell and taking the nucleus of that and transplanting it into a donated cell. Um, she passed away in 2003, um, and that was definitely earlier than was expected. She also had some health issues such as arthritis, um, and it was um, definitely hypothesized um, that there may have been some issues with her cells, um, in part due to this nucleus coming from a differentiated mammary cell. Um, that maybe not everything was fully reprogrammed because remember we have learned a lot about epigenetics and how you can have your DNA be methylated, you can have um, histones be acetylated, um, you can have phosphorylation occur next to those acetylations, um, and that some of those um, 
imprinting processes may not have been completely removed um, since the cell was fully differentiated. Um, we have been able to clone a lot of other mammals since this time. We've been able to clone mice, cats, cows, horses, mules, pigs, and dogs. CC um, is definitely um, probably one of the more well-known clones. Carbon copy for a cat. Um, she did differ from the parent um, because in part there's those cells are not going to want the DNA may be the same but what those cells are being exposed to by neighboring cells is not necessarily going to be the same um, and so you will have differences in appearance as well as in behavior even though you have identical DNA so there you can kind of see the process that went into producing Dolly. Um, again, in these nuclear transplantations that have taken place, um, only a small portion have led to an actual live birth. And a lot of these cloned animals like Dolly have had some issues. And I talked a little bit about this epigenetics earlier. Um, DNA methylation, histone acetylation, that's got to be reversed. Um, if you get the gene, you want the genes to be expressed, um, especially because those are the genes that are going to be involved in the initial development of that fertilized egg. If those genes aren't being expressed properly, um, it's going to be difficult to make it successfully through development. So I talked earlier about stem cells going from determined to differentiated or having to go all the way back to stem cells. These are typically unspecialized cells. Um, they are able to reproduce themselves and they can also differentiate. Um, so stem cells can be isolated um, early on in embryos. Um, at the blastocyst stage, they're known as embryonic stem cells. And those cells can differentiate into all types of cells found throughout the, an animal. Um, adults also have stem cells. These are used to replace um, specialized cells that are not able to reproduce. Um, and so we have been able to take skin cells and turn them into these embryonic stem cells um, by using viruses. Um, and the viruses basically help to introduce those genes that are needed to turn the cells from being differentiated back into a stem cell. Um, when this happens, they're known as IPS cells, induced pluripotent cells. Um, and so when you are able to transform these cells, um, they then can do whatever functions are needed, including treat some diseases or help um, with tissues that are no longer functioning. So again, you've got your stem cells. They should be able to make all types of cells. Um, and so with the embryonic stem cells, you can use them to make whatever cells that are needed. With the adult stem cells, you don't have as much flexibility. Um, they can make some cell types, but definitely not all cell types. Um, so if we take cells from an individual and we reprogram them so that they are more likely to act as stem cells as opposed to differentiated cells, um, we can then take those IPS cells and provide them with the chemicals that are needed so they will form specific cell types. So you're basically taking cells from that individual and putting them back into that individual. So that helps um, with the foreign rejection issue when you are taking, um, getting um, tissues from another individual. Um, and hopefully then they can repair the damage that has taken place. So DNA technology affects our lives all over the place. It affects what we eat. It affects the medicines we take. Um, it affects um, things that hit close to home in terms of crimes or other issues that might come into play. And it also affects our environment. So medically speaking, um, we definitely can do a lot more now to identify genes um, that are of consequence with um, genetic disorders. Um, and so by better understanding what genes are impacting um, the or having an impact on these disorders, we can look at the protein products, 
and then what kinds of changes, what, what kinds of modifications are we able to make um, or what medical um, treatments can we undergo um, to provide better protection. Um, so that's human gene therapy and there's a lot more work to do with that. Uh, when we start to get into um, gene therapy or just um, research in general where we're doing all this manipulation, we definitely have to consider ethical issues as well. Um, so here in the example with gene therapy, we're taking a piece of DNA that has been cloned. Um, we're taking the RNA version of the allele and we're adding it to a virus. Um, the virus is then placed um, so that it can infect the bone marrow cells and it's going to add that piece of DNA to those chromosomes and hopefully then it's going to repair the, um, the damaged DNA that has been present pre previous to this. So pharmaceuticals, this has helped us to make medications to be able to produce proteins um, in cells as well as in animals. And so this medication, imatinibib, sorry, um, it's called, um, basically prevents a leukemia receptor from being overexpressed. Um, so here you have a molecule that was able to be produced as a protein um, that then can be used to be um, provide medical treatments. Um, we can have cells produce a protein um, as they're being made, so that is going to help to simplify the purification process. Um, some examples include insulin, human growth hormones, as well as vaccines. And then we can have transgenic animals um, that basically have genes from one species um, incorporated into their DNA. Um, and if they have the gene that is incorporated is going to produce a protein that is well needed, um, this may be a nice way to get a lot of that particular protein developed. Um, forensics is definitely going to have a big um, stake in biotechnology uh, because we tend to look at genetic information as one way um, that we can better understand um, what evidence was there of an individual being present. Um, and we now have a lot better, a lot of better ways to analyze that DNA using the RFLPs. Uh, and we also can use it to look at STRs, which are variations in certain um, DNA sequences um, that are even smaller than RFLPs. Um, we can use PCR and gel electrophoresis to either analyze our RFLPs, but then we would have to do the Southern blotting, or we can just use PCR and gel electrophoresis to determine the length of the STRs. And it's pretty, it's highly unlikely that you're going to have two individuals with the same STR markers unless they are identical twins. Um, so there's a lot of evidence that has been collected over years from crime scenes um, that has not been able to be analyzed. This techniques, these techniques weren't there um, when the crimes, the when the evidence was collected, and now that they're able to go back and take a look, they are better able to determine whether individuals who were convicted of crimes truly were, um, whether their genetic information shows evidence of them being present in that scenario or whether it shows them not being able to be there. And in this case, we see with Washington, um, his SDRs do not match up with the evidence collected from the victim, um, but they do match up with another individual who later did play guilty after Washington had served 17 years for this crime. We talked about environmental cleanup. Um, so we might be able to modify um, organisms to better be able to utilize um, chemicals like oil, things like that, waste materials that we don't want to have available in our environment. And we're definitely using them a lot with agriculture. Um, so it's going to help with the breeding process. If you have utilized genetic engineering, it helps make plants better resist um, pests and droughts, things like that. Um, we use a TI plasmid often to um, put new genes into plants. 
Um, and so just a lot of applications with agriculture that are very beneficial. Um, so here you can see the DNA being inserted through the TI plasmid um, that's going to go into the plant and that will help that plant be more successful at depending on what the protein or what the DNA segment is coding for. Sorry, one, I missed this. I can get the last one. We did everything else. We'll do the last one. Sorry, I went too fast. Oh, we're not going all the way through it. Go to slide all the way down. Safety and ethical. So there definitely are a lot of issues associated with DNA technology. We really have to look at what we're wanting to accomplish, how beneficial it's going to be. Um, is there truly a valid reason to be doing the research that we're doing? Um, this is something that's being looked at with genetically modified organisms, organic materials. Um, and so, and since it does involve other organisms often that are taking in these recombinant DNA materials, um, you want to make sure that you have a lot of checks and balances in place to make sure that these are um, truly necessary um, experiments that need to be performed. Um, so there's a lot of um, organizations and committees out there um, that I'm sure can serve as a source of frustration because of all the paperwork that's involved, um, but it's for the greater good, making sure that things are being done um, for the right reasons and being done in as safe a manner as possible and being the data that's being collected is being treated with the utmost respect.